Welcome to No Limits, A Life of Power, brought to you by It Is Written. This is a series of presentations dedicated to revival because God wants you to thrive, to flourish. He wants you to reach great heights as a believer. God wants you to have a positive, successful Christian experience. And even when you hit a bump in the road, God wants you to look in His direction and know that He hasn't forsaken you and that you can go again in the strength of Jesus. Now, I've shared a statement with you already. It says, higher than the highest human thought can reach is God's ideal for His children. Too many of us, we get up, we might even get up high, and then we're down again. We're up and then we're down. But wait, what did Isaiah write? They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. God wants us to soar spiritually like eagles. So no more scratching around in the dirt like a chicken. You don't want to be like one of these birds. A chicken would be a good example. A pheasant, another. You're able to fly up for a moment and then it's back down to the earth. A peacock will do that. They look good, but they can't fly far. They get up and then they're down. We want to get up and stay up. We want to be close to God and be revived in our experience. So let's plan on that. Let's believe that God's going to do in us what He wants to do and what He promises to do. Now, what does it take to plug into God and make faith real and alive, particularly if you're a busy person? We know that life can overtake you sometimes. Imagine then being a university student. Your whole life is stretched towards you. You have class day after day. Maybe you've got a job. You've got relationships to keep up with, extracurricular activities. I asked some college students to share what they do to make sure faith in God in their life is strong. What are the important components of a life without limits? The most important thing of being connected with God is that you're gonna be able to witness to others. You cannot give from an empty cup. You need to fill your cup every day with the Word of God. Because when you're in the valley, you can look and be like, there are better days ahead. The grass is greener on the other side, and I know that God's got me even if the world doesn't. You know, like having your own personal daily devotions with Him, um, as well as um, being consistent. Understanding that nothing that we do comes from us, but from Him. So the one most important thing is remembering that He's the giver, remembering that He's the one that gives the desire to serve, the desire to speak for Him and stand up for Him. Let's pray together and we'll ask God's blessing before we open up His Word. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we are grateful to be able to come to you right now. We do so in the name of Jesus, trusting that you will revive us because that's your will. You have big plans for us. You want us to occupy eternity, to make up the population of heaven. Grant us that we can have a little heaven on earth as we are connected to you, enjoying your blessing and your presence in our lives. Revive us, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. It is one of the most famous stories ever told. A true story, a drama that played out in a place known as the Valley of Elah, about a 45-minute drive southwest of Jerusalem in Israel. If you visit that place, the story becomes very alive, very real. It's close to the location of Kerbet Kayafa, thought to be the site of a fortress of King David. It's near Beth Shemesh, which you read about in the Bible. When the Philistines sent away the Ark of the Covenant, they put it on a cart drawn by cattle, which took it to Beth Shemesh. The Valley of Elah is close to Gath, where Goliath was from. So it's no surprise that this is the place where the Philistines challenged the people of God. I've been there. We filmed a television program there. It was inspiring to see the sights and look at the geography. And imagine God's people on a hill on one side of the valley and the Philistines on a hill on the other side of the valley. Now, it's definitely the location where the battle took place. The battle between David and Goliath. David was a boy. He was a teenager. Now, his responsibilities day to day were those of a shepherd, not of a man of war, not of a soldier. At his father's behest, he went down to the Valley of Elah to take food to his brothers and to bring a report back to Jesse, his father, as to how things were going. Things, to be quite honest, were not going well. You find the story in 
Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 17, and we'll look at it now. We'll pick it up in verse 4. 1 Samuel 17 and verse 4. The Bible says, And there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. He was a very big man, standing at over nine feet tall. And he had a helmet of brass upon his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail. And the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of brass. And he had greaves of brass upon his legs. It's like shin pads. And a target of brass between his shoulders. And the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam. And his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron. And one bearing a shield went before him. And look at how Goliath taunted Israel. And he stood and cried unto the armies of Israel and said unto them, Why are ye come out to set your battle in array? Am not I a Philistine and ye servants to Saul? Choose you a man for you and let him come down to me. If he be able to fight with me and to kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then shall ye be our servants and serve us. And the Philistine said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. So how did Israel respond? Well, the Bible says this, When Saul and all Israel heard those words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. In other words, they were shattered. And so the story plays out. David says that he will indeed fight Goliath. He had killed a bear. He had killed a lion. That's David. So he felt maybe that he'd be okay against Goliath. And besides, someone had to do something. Israel was a laughingstock. They had God on their side, and yet they were really sort of pitiful. It's interesting that David's brothers were quite awful to him, basically telling him to mind his own business and accusing him of having selfish, prideful motives. But David volunteers. He wouldn't wear the king's armor because it didn't fit him well. Instead, he went down to battle with a stick, with a sling, and five stones in a small bag. That was it. And armed with a stick and stones, David waded into a battle with perhaps the most fearsome enemy Israel had ever faced. These were impossible odds. A boy against a warrior. Stones against a heavily armored and heavily armed fighter. This man had an armor bearer go before him. But there was one thing that tilted the balance a little bit. As David said to Goliath, You come to me with a sword and a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand. You read that in 1 Samuel 17 and verse 45. So here's the thing. We know how the story ends. We know that. But I'm wondering how the story ends for you. We all have Goliaths to face in our lives. For some, they're financial Goliaths. How are we going to get the bills paid? How are we going to meet our financial obligations or these financial crises or uh, unforeseen circumstances that sometimes break into our lives? What do we do about a Goliath like that? For some people, the Goliath might be, well, it could be a health challenge. It could be a relationship difficulty, a marriage that is imploding, or a friendship, or a, or a family situation that's coming apart. You might say, it's just too big for me. I can't hope to get through. Right? That's real. And I'm not here to tell you that things like that are not real. They are as real as real. We all have to deal with temptation. Temptation can be a monster bigger than Goliath. What do we do then? In some cases, temptation's getting the better of us. You might have an anger problem, a substance issue, an addiction of some kind. You might have a moral issue, a weakness with certain things on the internet. You might be prone to dishonesty. If you're not bothered by any of these, you might not be able to appreciate how challenging it is to be caught in such a situation. It's like you are David and the sin or the temptation or the issue is Goliath. You're not even sure where to find rocks and you don't have a sling. Well, I want to tell you that you have more than you think. When God is with you, there is no failure. With God on your side, you don't have to stumble or fall. 
You don't have to falter. With God on your side, you don't have to fear. You don't have to be dismayed and greatly afraid like King Saul and Israel. You can climb that Everest you're staring at. You can cross that ocean you're standing on the edge of. You can tame that lion, defeat that enemy. You can slay that Goliath. And I'm going to tell you how. One great misunderstanding of Christianity is that people believe it's about being better, being stronger, doing better, standing taller, being the best version of you. Well, okay, but let's be careful that we're going about that in the right way. God wants to remake people. According to what we read in Romans, we all are sinners who have come short of the glory of God. Jeremiah wrote that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. He asked, who can know it? And then we read that if anyone is in Christ, that person is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. So let's see how the impossible can happen in your experience. How can you face the challenges of tomorrow? Well, the challenges of today and know it's okay because God has got you. How can you slay the Goliath in your life? I want to take you with me to a special passage of the Bible in Matthew chapter 8. In fact, I'm going to show you several examples that reiterate a similar point. In Matthew 8, Jesus arrives in the town of Capernaum at the north end of the Sea of Galilee. A centurion comes to him, pleading with him. Now keep in mind, this was a centurion in the Roman army. And the Romans were the occupying force that were oppressing Israel. Nevertheless, a centurion comes to Jesus and says, Lord, my servant is lying at home paralyzed, dreadfully tormented. Jesus says, I will come and heal him, which is an extraordinary thing for someone to say. But what's more extraordinary is the response of the centurion. He says, no, don't come to my house. Who in the world would say that? The man you call Lord says to you, I will come to your place and I will heal your son you ought to say yes a thousand times, but this man says no, and it's quite remarkable that he did. But this is why. Because the centurion got it. He said to Jesus, Lord, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof, but only speak a word and my servant will be healed. Did you get that? He explained that. I also am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this one, go, and he goes. To another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. What he's saying is this, when I give an order, it gets carried out. So I believe that if you say the word, then what you say is actually going to get done. That's faith, he said. I'm relying on you and I believe that there is power in your word to the extent that you only need to say it and I believe it and then it's going to get done. Wow, what kind of faith is that? In fact, Jesus said, assuredly, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. And remember, this man wasn't a Jew, but he was someone who had faith in Jesus. He believed that what Jesus said would be done. And therefore, he expected that what Jesus said would be carried out. Even if he said, your son, deathly ill, has now been healed. There was no doubt in the man's mind. Now, if you are looking to revive your Christian experience, you want to know how you can have faith. Faith is the simple business of believing that God has said it and therefore God will do it. Let me give you some very practical examples of this. You've sinned, okay? You've sinned. You know you need to confess your sin and repent of your sin. But have you ever heard of someone saying that they're not sure if God can forgive them after all that they've done? 
I've gone too far this time. How can God forgive someone like me? I'm not sure God can possibly accept me after what I've done, except for one thing. And that's what the Bible says. In 1 John 1 and verse 9, nothing you've never heard before, it says this. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, did you understand that? Yes, you did. We confess, He forgives and cleanses. But what happens is this. The devil tells you that somehow you are the exception to the rule and that while God will forgive others, He won't forgive you. But you don't see anything in the text that says, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive my neighbor or that nice lady at church or Mrs. Smith or Mr. Brown, but not me. I don't see that in the passage. Now, I know that you can sometimes feel awful for what you've done. You can feel terrible. And frankly, that's not all bad. You might have done some bad things. But the Bible still says that if you confess, God will forgive. In fact, the Bible says in the book of Psalms that God is ready to forgive. And so faith says, although I've done some terrible things, I believe Jesus died for me. I believe God forgives me. That's faith. Now, in Matthew chapter 9, a woman who for 12 years had battled a very troubling medical problem is in the presence of Jesus. Although there was a crowd of people around, she reached out and touched the hem of Jesus' garment, the very edge of His clothing. She believed that if she would touch Jesus' clothing, she would be healed. Now, you see, that was faith. Her attitude was, He is a healer, and therefore, I believe that He can heal me if I can just touch Him. Just, just the edge of His clothing, she believed that would be enough. And in that instant, she was healed. After all of those years of suffering, she was healed. But I want you to notice something. This is quite interesting. In Luke 8 and verse 45, Jesus said, Who touched me? When all denied it, Peter and those with him said, Master, the multitudes throng and press you, and you say, Who touched me? There were people bumping up against Jesus all over the place. Yet when this woman reached out and touched him, he noticed. Jesus noticed the touch of faith. It didn't make any sense to his disciples. And it might not make sense to you that Jesus notices your touch of faith in the midst of the crowd, but He does. Now, when the woman saw that she was not hidden, she came trembling and falling down before Him. She declared to Him in the presence of all the people the reason she had touched Him and how she was immediately healed. And He, Jesus, said to her, Daughter, be of good cheer. Your faith has made you well. Go in peace. You see, when you reach out to touch Jesus from wherever you are, in North Dakota, in Ontario, Canada, in Michigan, Kentucky, Florida, Europe, the South Pacific, no matter where you are, no matter what is going on around Jesus, He knows that you've reached out to Him by faith. Faith says, he can. Faith says He will if that's His will. This was a Goliath-sized struggle that the woman was in. But Goliath was slain in her experience through faith in Jesus. Ephesians 2 verse 8 says, We are saved by grace through faith. We believe and we accept Jesus died for you. And when you believe that, that becomes real in your experience. The Bible says that when Abraham believed God, that was counted to him for righteousness. A verse in Romans chapter 4 really makes this powerful point clear for us. It says that Abraham did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, 
but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God and being fully convinced that what he had promised, he, that's God, was also able to perform. Did you see that? He was fully convinced that what God had promised, God could do. You get this with the I don't see how God issues. The Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, of course, there are alternatives to the creation account. Some say the earth and us and everything are the result of just natural processes. There's talk of natural selection, evolution, survival of the fittest, the Big Bang. I understand that, especially if you don't believe in God. If you don't believe that God exists, you're hardly likely to believe in the creation account in the Bible. I understand that. And then there's this very significant question of how in the world someone could create something out of nothing. But evolution is faced with the same question. People who believe creation will tell you that God made something out of nothing. People who believe evolution will have to admit that they believe nothing made something out of nothing. I know what I'd rather believe. You cannot call yourself a person of faith while denying the foundational story of the Bible. In the beginning, God made it all. He formed us into existence and breathed into humankind the breath of life. It's what the Bible says. Jesus believed it. You see, a Bible believer has the entire Bible to base their faith on. The Bible is the story of Jesus, a man that even history talks about. We look at the prophecies of the Bible. Daniel 2, outlining the history of the world with the rise and fall of great kingdoms. Daniel 7, doing the same. Daniel 9, and the amazing prophecy of the Messiah. These are all reasons why you can have faith in the Bible, why you can trust God Himself. Faith ought to be the easiest thing in the world because God either exists or He doesn't. The Bible is either true or it's not. And you can either trust it or you can choose not to trust it. Think of what life would mean if you could not trust the Bible. This life would be all there is. You'd have your three score and ten and nothing else. Not the most hopeful thing. Instead, we're able to look forward believing that there is a God who stands behind what He says. Put God to the test. Believe His promises. Trust Him. Believe that He's there for you. Too many people call themselves Christians. They don't have faith. They won't stand on the Word of God. They won't claim the promises of God. They'll read something in the Bible and say, well, that just seems too far-fetched. That seems too difficult. Maybe God cannot even do that. Your faith, when it goes only as far as your human reasoning, well, that's not faith at all. A friend of mine lost a lot of weight. And so what did he have to do? He had to go and buy new clothes because the much slimmer him did not fit his much larger clothing. So what did he do with his old clothes? You think he kept them? Why would he keep them if he believed he was going to keep the weight off? Keeping the old clothes would have been a lack of faith on his part. When Elisha accepted God's call, he burned up the plowing equipment he was using at the time. He was saying, I'm not going back, I'm going forward. I once met a witch doctor who gave his life to Jesus. He asked me to come to his home and burn up all of his witch doctor paraphernalia. He said, I'm not going to be needing this anymore. When God calls you, you can follow Him and believe that He will lead you and provide for you because He promises to do so. You can trust Him. You can grow your spiritual life right now. Decide to take God at His word. Believe His promises. Allow God to have your heart. Trust Him in every area of your life. How big is your God? Some people don't tithe because they think they can't afford it. Wait, faith would say, we'll do that and we'll expect God to provide for us. And He would. I'm not sure about stepping out in faith because I'm concerned about my job. No, no, instead you step out in faith and expect God to come through for you. Just before Jesus returns, when the final gospel message has been proclaimed to the world, Jesus says, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. I want to see you in that group. God wants to see you in that group. You want to see you in that group. Faith is about leaning on Jesus, 
letting Him do His work, believing His Word. We want to do that and we can. You can have faith today. God appeared one day to Noah or at least spoke to Noah and He said, Noah, build a boat. It's going to rain. And Noah had to have said, rain? But God said, you can believe me. You can trust me. And Noah knew that he could. He built an ark for rain that had never before fallen. Gideon was approached by God. Get an army together. You're going to defeat the enemy. Gideon said, I have 32,000 men here. God said, way too many. Then he said, I have thousands because many thousands left them. God said, way too many. Gideon said, I have 300. God said, that's the right amount. And Gideon didn't run for the hills and say, that's not enough. Gideon said, 300 in my army with God's blessing will defeat anybody who dares oppose us. Come on, my friend, how is your faith today? You don't have to have faith in you, nor do you need to have faith in your faith, but faith in God. He is a great God and He is able. Can we pray about this? Can we pray, God, would you give us great faith? Let's pray together now. Our Father in heaven, we thank You. We thank You for the gift of faith. Grow our faith, increase our faith, and give us grace to believe that You are able to do and will do the things You say You will do. Grow us, keep us, bless us, and revive us. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. And God bless you. And thank you so much for joining me on No Limits, a life of power brought to you by It Is Written. See you again next time.